binge the full week of the Ray Taylor Show ad free over at Patreon.com slash Inspired Disorder. What you manifest in your mind, you can bring to reality. This is my top five Ryan Johnson films, the writer and director of only five films. Uh, which, uh, you know, I will be talking about those five films in this episode, ranking them my least to most favorite, which is tough. I mean, even my least favorite Ryan Johnson film is better than most films out today. Uh, he has uh, done independent films. He's done giant block franchise blockbuster films. Uh, and uh, I just love everything he's doing and where he's going, but let's get into it, shall we? Starting off with my number five, my least favorite Ryan Johnson film, and it breaks my heart that there's a least favorite, uh, but this one is still a great film. I enjoy it quite a bit. It is a fun film, a little bit long, but a fun film nonetheless. That film is called The Brothers Bloom. This is a film that I actually first saw at a uh, screening at a film festival in San Diego. It was like the headlining film, the premiere of The Brothers Bloom. It was like a situation where they had uh, security guards at the front of the theater and they had like these devices where they monitored the audience to make sure that they weren't recording the film. Uh, and I don't know if I'd watched, I'd probably seen the movie once or twice since then. It came out in 2008. Uh, it's starring, uh, let's see here, we got Rock, uh, Rachel Weiss, uh, Adrian Brody, Mark Ruffalo, uh, Rinko Kikuchi, some, some good actors, uh, Ricky Gray, some great actors. It's about, it's like a con movie, con man movie, uh, where the brothers, um, Mark Ruffalo and uh, Adrian Brody are brothers, uh, Bloom brothers, and they were uh, orphans. They were passed from foster home to foster home, uh, and as children realized, uh, at least uh, Ruffalo's character, Mark Ruffalo's character realized his, uh, his ability to plan these elaborate long cons uh, which is fun. It's got this is a movie that really felt has serious Wes Anderson vibes to it. Um, you know, it's out of I mean, Ryan Johnson, amazing writer. All of his films have like a complexity to them. There's always a level of mystery. He's very good at just letting information trickle out throughout the storytelling to 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 let the audience kind of go along on these journeys. And the Brothers Bloom is a good one of those. It's just uh, so many like twists and turns and and backstabbing and and double cons and it's it's you almost you relate a lot to Adrian Brody's character who's the younger of the Brothers Bloom. He felt like his whole life had been written by his brother because they'd been doing these cons that his brother had planned his whole their whole lives. Uh, so as an audience member, you get to a place where you don't know what's real. Like everything, when it's revealed, makes sense. But it's just so much that it just feels like a bit too much. But it, it's a fun movie. It has the, like I said, the Wes Anderson kind of comedic vibe to it uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's a great movie, and I still love it. But it's my least favorite of his uh, so it's coming in at number five. It was a lot of fun to revisit all these movies, by the way. Uh, you know, it's been a while. Uh, but coming in, my number four Ryan Johnson film that I love, my number four is Looper. It is the film, the third film in his, uh, no, his, no, the third. So this is the film that came out after The Brothers Bloom. Uh, starring uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis. Uh, Paul Dano's got a small part in it. You got The Dude is a small part in it. It's a, a sci-fi hitman movie. Uh, time travel is involved. Basically, uh, people in the past, like the, eventually a time machine is, is made and it becomes extremely illegal. Uh, so the only people using time machines are uh, criminals uh, and organized crime. And what the criminals are using time travel for is to 
execute people. Uh, so to get rid of people, because it's impossible to murder people in the future. Uh, so what they do is they, they capture people and they put them in the time machine and they send them back into the past where loopers exist and are waiting and shoot them on arrival uh, and they get teleported in with uh, payment. And eventually they close the loop in which they actually capture the looper in the future and send them back uh, t so they kill themselves and uh, that kill comes with a bigger payout. Uh, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays the younger version of Bruce Willis. Uh, it's a movie that also has uh, like telekinesis as a thing that happened to human, humans. And uh, it's a, a, a movie because it deals with time and uh, basically Bruce Willis escapes. So uh, they're trying to close Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character's uh, loop off and they send back Bruce Willis, but uh, Bruce, before getting sent back, was able to get loose, and part of his escape was to go back, and he's able to subdue Joseph Gordon-Levitt and, and go on the run. And what happens when you go on the run, which they show with Paul Dano's character, is that they capture the younger version of you, and they start, they write, they carve messages into your arm, like meet us here or else. And then you start noticing that digits start falling. It's like this crazy scene where this guy is trying to get to this place because they captured Paul Dano, who is his younger self. And he's like literally just kind of his parts of his body are just falling apart as he's trying to get there. Um, and once he gets there, he gets popped in the head. Uh, it's a great movie. Uh, the makeup that they made Joseph Gordon-Levitt wear, I, I remember a story that uh, Bruce Willis didn't want to do any extra makeup, so instead they made uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt look more like Bruce Willis, uh, which I didn't mind this time rewatching it. I really enjoyed the movie. The end really ties everything nice up. I mean, Ryan Johnson is just a great writer. He's, he's a great director, too. Uh, he doesn't have, like, the unique visual styling of a lot of directors necessarily, like uh, like, uh, like uh, Wes Anderson, for instance. He doesn't necessarily have a signature style, but his writing, I mean, he's a solid director, hands down. Uh, the visual moments in some of his films are, are amazing, but the writing is next level. Uh, so Looper is coming in at my number four. My number three pick is the very first Ryan Johnson film that I watched probably at the same uh, film festival a year or two prior. Uh, and that mo it came out in 2005. That film is Ryan Johnson's Brick, also starring Gor Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It's a modern-day uh, neo-noir uh, set in California, the suburbs of California, where Joseph Gordon-Levitt, the high school student, uh, and he's kind of the detective, the not really a detective, but he, you know he's for this film. He is the he's trying to solve a mystery. Uh, a friend of his, uh, a, a lady friend of his, ends up having trouble, kind of reaching out that she's in trouble, and then she winds up dead. So Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character is trying to find out what happened to her. And the dialogue in this movie is very much like a noir film. Well-written, snappy dialogue, very stylized. Uh, the fact that it takes place in Southern California uh, in high school years definitely reminds me a lot of a film I re reviewed last week called The Kid Detective. Uh, just a very interesting way to take that noir style and transplant it in not only a younger subsection of people, but also the kind of bright, sunny skies of Southern California. Like, it looked like Orange County kind of area. Uh, I love that film so much, and when I first made the list, that was my number two. But after rewatching all the movies, I had to bump it down to number three. But uh, Brick is amazing. Highly recommend watching it. Uh, again, great writing, great like mystery writing, complex mystery writing from uh, Ryan Johnson, which I love that he writes and directs all of his movies, including my number two pick, which is 
the biggest movie. Actually, I don't know if it's the biggest movie he's ever done, but it is, as far as culturally, the biggest movie he's done, being part of a franchise, uh, a, a giant franchise that a lot of people worship. Blockbuster movie. This is a movie that came out on my birthday in... What year was that? It came out 2017, December 15th. I went on an edible to the movie theater to watch Ryan Johnson's directorial uh, submission into this franchise, which I am not a huge fan of this franchise, but that movie is Star Wars, The Last Jedi, which I feel... This movie is the best Star Wars film, hands down. Uh, the fact that it comes with the baggage of Star Wars kind of sucks because most Star Wars movies are not good. Uh, but this one was the best. It had comedy. It had action. It had drama. It had emotion. It brought new characters. It fleshed out new characters, which ended up getting shit on in the, the next, the final, uh, the... the uh, with the Jedi Awakens or whatever, J.J. Abrams ruined the the that kind of new prequel in the third one. But Star Wars: The Last Jedi is amazing. There are visual moments of in this film that are are iconic. They're just the most gorgeous, most beautifully captured visuals in the Star Wars universe. I believe are in this. It's got some amazing stuff. Uh, amazing battles, um, even some of the cheesy stuff that, you know, when Finn and that, the, the Asian girl that her character just completely got shit on in the, in the third film, like when they go to the casino to try and find the code breaker and they're, you know, they're only able to get, uh, Benicio Del Toro who's doing a weird kind of accent. I still love that because it's fleshing out her character, even though it was pointless because in the sequel, she's a nothing character but ryan johnson really really gave and they had a moment her and finn when they're on the salt planet which also showing new planets that aren't just desert and forest like there's some imagination to the not only the different planets but new characters like it's just by far my favorite star wars film and it's not surprising that it's by one of my favorite writer directors ryan johnson uh, it was such a, a treat to watch again. Uh, just so from the battle, like the, even the things with Ray and Kylo Ren, amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, like where he, there's moments where they team up and they're against each other, and that crazy battle scene in the red, the red room, just am visually amazing. I loved it so much. That's why it's my number two. It overtook Brick because it, it's just it's. I mean. I loved Star Wars growing up, and it's such a bummer to see what happened to that franchise. Just one of the, in my opinion, one of the most overrated franchises. For the amount of, like, worship and fandom that, like, so many humans have their identity is Star Wars. Sucks, because so many of the movies are horrible. And not only just, like, the originals were good, but then you had the creator, who's not good, like, this, the premise of star wars was stolen and then he just made up stuff like i understand there's a lot of you know books and comics and spin-off shows and things that add a lot to the story and whatever i'm talking about the movie franchise the original three were okay but then george lucas goes back and tinkers with them even the ones that he didn't direct he directed the first one which was made better by rogue one but you know i don't like the fact that i don't like artists that go back to their old work and re-edit shit just make new shit. Don't go back. Stop. You, you, once you put it out, you put it out. That's it. Unless you want to like clean it up and just make things look better. But don't add stuff. Don't change stuff. Just don't do any of that. And then he made the, the prequels, which all the prequels are, are horrible. All three of them are horrible. The, the Han Solo movie was, would have been great if, if Disney didn't get rid of the original directors. So by far, because there's a lot more misses than hits in the franchise, Star Wars The Last Jedi, and The Last Jedi is the best. I mean, Force Awakens is basically a reboot 
of the an original franchise, which is okay. It got a lot of like nostalgia from seeing everything again. Uh, but I think as a, a, a movie from top to bottom, Star Wars The Last Jedi is the best. And I love that so many Star Wars fans hate it. I love it. It's so sad that they love, they love what J.J. Abrams did far more than this. It's just ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, it's coming in at my number two, Star Wars The Last Jedi, which leaves only one film left. He's only directed as of this recording in 2021, July 4th. Ryan Johnson has only written and directed five films. Well, uh, released, anyway. So my number one film by Ryan Johnson is also his most recent film, and that film is Knives Out. Uh, Knives Out, a whodunit, where you find out whodunit pretty early on in the film. Uh, but it's a movie that, it, it's just so, again, highlights how amazing Ryan Johnson is as a writer. It shows how good he is as a storyteller, just giving you enough information to keep you along for the ride. Like you're finding out as everybody else is finding out. You have uh, Benoit Blanc, an amazing character that thankfully from what I read when I looked up, looked into, uh, I know they're doing a Knives Out 2. Uh, apparently he's not only doing a Knives Out 2, He's, going, he's in pre-production for Knives Out 3, along with another movie called Poker Face, starring Natasha Leone, which I am a huge fan of hers as well. Um, excited to see Russian Doll Season 2, if that's still in the works. Uh, but loved Russian Doll Season 1 that's on Netflix. So excited to see what Poker Face is all about. Uh, but next up is going to be Knives Out 2, which is starring Daniel Craig reprising his role as Benoit Blanc, uh, and it, just amazing. It's just so good. Like, it's a movie that's not only well-written, well-told, great directing, but it's a story that really takes advantage of what's going on culturally, how, how drastically different so many people are. I mean, in this family, it's a, a wealthy family uh, where the, the patriarch of the family is, uh, created a successful mystery novel uh, franchise, and the family has profited off of that. They all feel like they're self-made in their way, despite the fact that they got all their, you know, their starting money from their dad, like all rich people do. Uh, some of the kids are Nazis. Some of the kids are wealthy, privileged liberals, uh, fake liberals in a lot of ways. Uh, so it really represents a lot of the people that are out there culturally, the parents that are like, it, it, it just all of the characters are so diverse and so well written and it works so well for the story it's you know a, a movie where you think you know what's happening like it's a movie that shows you what happened but you still don't know like there's still a twist at the very end of this film which wraps up in a way where you feel so good like it's one of those movies where the good guys actually win uh and and all of the privileged assholes lose. Uh, it, it's just such a good movie, top to bottom. I loved it so much, and it doesn't come with the Star Wars baggage. You don't have to see prequels or sequels or you know, watch some animated series that explains this thing or whatever. It's just a great movie, a lot of fun. Uh, so Knives Out, my number one Ryan Johnson film, and I am super excited that... Uh, there's going to be two more. Because I don't know, how, what are you going to do? Daniel Craig, obviously, is the, the link between them all. It would be fun if there's references. Because there's references to other you know, things that he's solved, other cases that he's worked in this one when he's kind of being introduced. Uh, so maybe it would be fun if, if, it, if it's going back to showing you one of those things. Uh, but knowing that Ryan Johnson is... Uh, the one writing and directing, uh, so much hope for, especially a trilogy of them, which I believe that he's still attached to do a trilogy of Star Wars films at some point in the future, uh, which I'll be excited for. You know, the only time I'll be excited for Star Wars is if Ryan Johnson returns to the franchise. But uh, yeah, Ryan Johnson, one of my favorite all-time writers, 
directors, you know, as far as people that write and direct their own stuff, uh, he's he's done a, a wide range of things, but all of them have the are related in that they have complex stories. Like the the storytelling is complex. It's layered. It's it's required to be told in a way where, as the director, he's able to really flesh out his complex stories and mysteries. And like, as an audience member, you're like you are so invested in what's happening on screen. And I love him so much. So let me run down my top five uh, Ryan Johnson films as I see them, as I see them, as I rank them. Number five, The Brothers Bloom. Number four is Looper. Number three is Brick. Number two is Star Wars The Last Jedi. And number one is Knives Out. Almost in uh, order that they were released, like Brick being his first one, uh, I think maybe just because that was uh, the first of the... I don't know. It's definitely number three. But they're almost in chronological order of release. It's like he is definitely getting better you know he's he's he understood his voice of like understanding that he can handle complex narratives which i think he 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 does a flex on in brothers bloom like the character of of uh the the older brother um ruffalo like that that almost feels like that's a ryan johnson surrogate because he's he's got a lot of pride in in his ability to write these crazy cons and i think ryan johnson takes a lot of pride in the fact that he's able to write these complex stories and flesh them out in a way that's visually i mean even if he didn't write these and he was just a director he's an amazing director but the fact that you have these complex stories and complex narratives um which may be not even that complex but just the way that just expertly written and executed visually is is amazing, and I love it. And uh, super stoked, super ready to see whatever he does. So that's my top five Ryan Johnson film. How do you rank the Ryan Johnson films? What are your t- how would you rank Ryan Johnson's films? Let me know. I would love to hear uh, what your rankings of his films are. I highly recommend everybody checking them out. I own all five of them, and uh, it's just it's just one of those directors that it's crazy. He's, he's really not made a bad movie, which is tough. It's tough. Like, every, eventually he's going to do it, and I'm scared for that day. Maybe it'll be the next Knives Out, but I doubt it. I think, I think, he's, I think he's hitting his stride in a lot of ways. Um, maybe the Star Wars ones. Like, maybe Disney will get in there and, and mess, mess up his Star Wars films, uh, which wouldn't be surprising. Uh, but anyway, Ryan Johnson, amazing writer, filmmaker. Check him out. That is my top five. Get yourself some new cell phone service that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. It's great service, coast to coast, but the low rates are what you're going for. And because you go through my link, inspireddisorder.com slash ting, that's right, ting is the cell phone service, you're going to get $25 in credit. You can use that credit towards your service. You can use that credit towards a phone. If you already have a phone and you want to keep your phone, but you just don't want to pay so much for your cell phone service, head on over to Ting. Make sure you go through my link, inspireddisorder.com slash Ting. That way you get $25 in credit to use towards anything over at Ting. Inspireddisorder.com slash Ting. New episodes of The Ray Taylor Show come out every single day. Subscribe on IGTV, YouTube, and everywhere else podcasts are found. Binge the full week ad free over at patreon.com slash inspired disorder. Buy Ray Taylor Show merch over at inspireddisorder.com. And follow the show on Instagram at Ray Taylor Show. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Peace out.